Aside from the mysterious elevator workers of the oddly chronically broken elevators and the Israeli movers contracted by Zim Shipping Company, itself partly Israeli state-owned, which broke a $50,000 lease in the World Trade Center to relocate to Virginia a week before 9-11, who else had suspicious access to the towers? If bombs were inside, how could they be set in there with so many employees working in the towers? And who did it? You can forget about security, that's a non-issue. But exactly how and where could one place charges without anyone noticing? A good place to start would be the men arrested for fake IDs that granted them access to the towers to fix sprinkler systems, upgrade internet cables, move out furniture, and work on chronically broken elevators. Especially when the Israeli-owned company they claimed to work for had no authenticity. In 2002, a simple case of fraud over fake IDs in Tennessee led to the arrest of six Middle Eastern men and revealed damning information about 9-11, about men claiming to have done work in the basement of the towers with fake passes. The key witness, herself an accomplice in the ID fraud, who may have been able to shed light on the entire matter was Catherine Smith, but the day before her trial, she had a car accident and died. Actually, her body had been burned inside her car, but the gas tank failed to ignite. Witnesses had seen Smith ablaze in her car, and investigators found gasoline in her clothing. FBI agent Susan Nash said that Smith had been murdered. The unresolved questions about 9-11 and Smith's death had nothing outside of the circumstantial to do with the trial of her fake IDs, however. Catherine Smith, a Department of Motor Vehicles employee, had been working with Khalid Otala from Jerusalem to provide Tennessee license, which do not require social security numbers, for five other men. The FBI, working on a tip, arrested Odala outside the DMV after he purchased the IDs from Smith. They had been monitoring Catherine Smith's house. She had also bought her car from Odala, one she would be found dead inside of later. The following group, Muhammad Fares, Abdel Musin Hamad, Mustafa Abu Shahid, and Omar Kayata, were all arrested as they were also waiting outside for Odala to return from the DMV. Catherine Smith had lived an ordinary life as a driver's license examiner, but in February of 2002, her arrest for fraud and then her death in a mysterious fiery car crash made her the subject of a worldwide interest. She, did she commit suicide or was she murdered as part of a terrorist plot? We were going to have a detention hearing on uh, February the 11th, and on that day, the day before, the morning of that day, uh, Catherine Smith uh, died in the car. 49-year-old Catherine Smith would have ranked among the unlikeliest people to ever become the centerpiece of a federal investigation into international terrorism. By all accounts, she was quiet, spiritual, and family devoted. The kind of ordinary existence which made her arrest in February of 2002 even more mystifying. Smith, who had worked for nine years as a driver's license examiner, was swooped up at her place of business in an FBI raid along with five men of Arab descent. She was charged with selling fake driver's licenses to them for $1,000 apiece. But with America still reeling from the 9-11 terrorist attacks just months before, what might have been viewed as a simple case of greed soon ballooned into an international incident that produced worldwide headlines. Strangely, after the arrests, Smith was released on her own recognizance. The five men, including Memphis store owner Khalid Adtala, believed to be the ringleader of the phony license operation, were taken into custody as investigators searched for a link between the men and any possible connections to the 9-11 attacks. But was all this motivated by fact or frenzy? Because of the world events and the uh presumption that seems to be floating around about people of Middle Eastern descent. And it would get a lot stranger. When on February 10th, Smith's charred body was found inside the remains of her burned 1992 Acura, a car she had bought from Otala. Breathless witnesses told authorities the car, going at a slow rate of speed, rammed into a utility pole. A gas container was found in the back seat of the car. An autopsy declared Smith died with smoke inhalation from the fire inside the car that ignited before the crash. Unusual suspicious, bizarre, all of the aforementioned. But with Smith's horrendous death and four months of investigation into the backgrounds of the men turning up nothing except for the fact three of them were illegal aliens, public interest finally faded. Four of the men were eventually deported. Another was quietly returned back to his home in New York. None were implicated in Smith's death because they were in custody at the time. The underlings told investors that Khalid or Sakur Hamad, the cousin of Abdul Musin Hamad, could get the ID. Oddly, the two ringleaders would be released while the underlings had the book thrown at them. Zakir Hamad 
who had shared a residence with Otala Khalid, was arrested, and on his person, he had a pass granting him entry into the six underground levels of World Trade Center 1. It was dated September 5th, 2001. Khalid Otala had also driven a truck from New York to Tennessee on 9-11. Hamad claimed that he had been doing work on the sprinkler systems for a couple of days, and that is why he had a pass. The problem with that, as Alan Hicks, the spokesperson of the Port Authority of New York, pointed out, the New York Port Authority handles its own work on such systems, and no one there had contracted Hamad. Hamad gave police a card for magic heating and plumbing. He also had a card at the time of his arrest. In court, his father produced a letter signed by Sergei A. David Inko for Dinko Mechanical, verifying both Sahira Muhammad and his cousin's employment. David Inko told the New York Times Hamad had been working in the World Trade Center for him for a couple of days. The problem is, there was no magic heating and plumbing or a Dinko Mechanical. There was an obsolete business license for Dinko, and the address for the office was simply David Inko's residential address quite similar to the elevator operator's fiasco. Hamad was released on a $250,000 bail. What kind of truck driver or repairman has that kind of money? Dotala, the middleman, was released hours after being sentenced. Why was Khalid released? And why wasn't there a follow-up investigation into Denko Mechanical?